Hello you beautiful people, today we are here to talk about how the health and safety protocols could impact your fantasy team. So as we're all aware, there's tons of absences going around the league right now, tons of players are missing games, and it's creating a lot of holes in teams for other players to come in and sort of fill those gaps. So today I'm going to go ahead and go through every NBA team that's sort of been affected by health and safety protocols, go over whose values I think will increase on the teams, and sort of talk about like waiver wire pickups, guys who I would try to sell high on over these periods. But mostly I'm going to focus on like the waiver wire guys who I think will benefit the most and who could be pickups for your fantasy teams. So before we begin, feel free to drop a like on the video and subscribe if you're new. We're trying to hit 2,000 subscribers here. Really appreciate all the support. And yeah, don't forget to join the Discord through the link in the description. Really great community in there if you have any fantasy trade questions, NBA questions, anything at all. But with that being said, let's just go ahead and get right into it. This is going to be a bit of a longer video, so bear with me. I'll timestamp when I talk about every team in the description to help you like skip to maybe if you have players on a certain team and you're wondering what I'm going to say about them, that'll be in the description as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. I should mention if any of these guys' games get postponed, obviously that definitely affects their value and I wouldn't recommend picking them up, but we can't really predict that, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the Brooklyn Nets. So as we're all aware, their big three is now officially all in the health and safety protocols. we got KD's out, Kyrie is out, Harden is also out. So if we go ahead and look at their lineups, I mean, they're really run bare. They're missing like all of their starters. Claxton, Harris, Aldridge are out as well. Bruce Brown, Millsap, Bembry, James Johnson. There's literally like no one left on their roster. So if we're looking at guys that I think are pickups, I think Patty Mills is probably must roster for the duration of this time, just because I do all the way up to like eight or 10 team leagues, like he's going to be getting like 20 shots a game. No way around it. Like there's nobody really to take the burden other than him who they can like rely on consistently, consistently right now. And then also Britt Blake Griffin, I think is definitely worth a pickup. I was going to record this earlier before today's games, but they've both been having pretty decent games against the Magic. I just had to wait to see the Celtics get a dub against the Knicks first. You guys know how it is. Then in terms of other pickups, Cam Thomas, I think is a good waiver wire pickup there. He's going to be getting like 30 minutes a night. And he's shown some potential so far this season. I mean, he might not be too efficient right now as he is a rookie, but he has the potential to have some big games in the absence of their big three. Then another two guys that are fairly new to the team that you might not be too aware of, Kessler Edwards and David Duke Jr., David Duke's pretty solid rebounder. He could have like a pretty decent night. I mean, he's not the greatest shooter in the world, but he could have a solid night, get you some decent fantasy points. If you're in a deeper league, he might still be on your waiver wire because he was just recently added to fantasy. So in terms of the Nets, those are the guys whose values I think will increase the most or who will become relevant for fantasy. But honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the Nets like games start getting postponed at this rate because they have like just the minimum amount of players required to like play in an NBA game. So Definitely a situation to monitor, but right now, like I mentioned, Patty Mills, Blake Griffin, Kessler Edwards, David Juke Jr., and Cam Thomas are pretty much just their starters. I mean, someone's going to have to produce, and it's odds are it's going to be probably Patty Mills, like I mentioned, but who knows, maybe one of the other guys can step up, and I think they could be a really solid waiver wire option while everyone else is in the protocols. Next up is my Boston Celtics, who just came off a W against the Knicks, like I mentioned. I was going to make this before, and I did have Josh Richardson on my list of players who I think would benefit from all the like injuries or people in protocols I should mention like Dennis Schroeder and Al Horford and they have like all of our forwards are gone too like Grant Williams is in the protocols I don't have the whole list of it but pretty much we're missing all of our Jabari Parker like all our power forwards are front court players that are like backup reserves so I was I was imagining that Josh Richardson would sort of step up and take a bigger role and I wasn't expecting him to go off like he did tonight for 58 fantasy points but I am expecting his role to be significantly larger than it was and if it this tonight's any indication of if he can go on a little bit of a stretch where he's averaging a solid amount of fantasy points per game. I think it's worth picking him up in my deeper leagues. I would definitely recommend picking him up off the waiver wire. And then for this week, I think it could be a good time to sell high on Time Lord. He just hasn't been getting the minutes with him and Horford both on the when they're both healthy. So I think if he has a pretty solid run of performances over the next few games with Horford out, I wouldn't be opposed to trying to sell high on him. I think that's a good opportunity. And then outside of them, I don't really think anyone's going to become too relevant for fantasy because it's pretty much just like backup front court players that are going to be like that are like missing is what I meant to say so yeah pretty short one but that's pretty much all the fantasy implications I can see happening from the players on the Celtics and the protocol so we'll just go ahead and get on to the next team so the Bulls are just coming over a recent uh, health and safety protocol thing going on so they have some players returning to the lineup they still have Zach Levine out and then in terms of their like forwards I mean obviously we already know about Patrick Williams then DeSomo's out I'm probably butchering his name Derek Jones Jr. Troy Bount, Alize Johnson, Stanley Johnson are all out so I'm thinking maybe the only people that I could see realistically becoming more like relevant for fantasy or having their fantasy values increase a significant margin is I'd probably target like a Kobe White if I'm in like a 16 team league. I think he could be worth a roster spot just because like they don't have a lot of people left on their bench. Probably going to get a few more shot attempts, a few more minutes, and he just he just exited the protocol so he will presumably be back for their next game. 
against the Lakers on Sunday, so definitely something to monitor, but I, th- I can see him being relevant for like a few fantasy games while the Bulls are missing the majority of their players. And then also, the next person on my list is probably going to be Alex Caruso. I could see his value taking a little uptick the next few games, but like I said, the Bulls are sort of just recovering over like a recent burst. They're getting their starters back, like DeRozan. So overall, not too big a deal. Just Levine being out is going to hurt their production. Obviously, there's going to be more shots for Vucevic, DeMar, and Lonzo. But I don't really feel like talking about them too much because that's pretty evident. It's not really going to change your fantasy team. I'm not going to tell you to trade for them if it's just like four four games or so of Levine being out what they have inflated value. But I predicted maybe sell Vooch high if he had a good week last week. Short to say he did not, so I'm not going to go ahead and make that prediction again. But yeah, Bulls again, not too relevant. Just a few minor health and safety protocol players, but nothing too major for fantasy anyway. All right, so we move on to the Cavaliers, who only have Mobley and Okoro in the protocols. But in terms of players whose value I think will take an increase from their absence, I think primarily Kevin Love. I think he's probably going to see a few additional minutes with Mobley being out. He's still probably going to come off the bench. I think they are going to start Dean Wade, who also is on my list here. But I think he's probably like the tertiary beneficiary benefactor of this situation. But second on my list is going to be Chetty Osman. I think his fantasy value is going to take a little bit of an increase just with Okoro and Moli being out. It's a bit of like there's a bit more minutes available in their front court. And I, they're playing Milwaukee tonight. So as the time of recording this, he's doing all right so far. But I would expect his value to probably be around 30 fantasy points per game while they're in the absence because he, he is capable of going on little streaks here. We all know he's a solid shooter from outside. So definitely something to monitor there. Could have a, some good value for this week if he's on your waiver wire. And then next up, on the only, I think that's pretty much it. And then Dean Wade, like I mentioned. I could see him maybe having a little bit of a fantasy impact for my deeper leagues, but this is more for like the 20 teams and up leagues. Like it's not going to be anything crazy or relevant for like any sort of shallow league. But he put up 32 fantasy points against Houston. If he's getting starters minutes, then who knows? Maybe he'll be fantasy relevant when you're in like the 20 team leagues, man. You just need anything you can get. So anyone with any upside that's on the waivers could be worth a grab. And I think Dean Wade sort of falls into that category in a 20 team league. So that's it for the Cavs. Next up, we're going to go on to the Mavericks. Today's video is brought to you by Manscaped, who's the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping if you use the code TBP at checkout at manscaped.com. So, imagine shaving with a sleek, well-designed, and optimized trimmer that makes shaving time your favorite time in the bathroom. I'm one of the first people to try the 4.0, as you can see right here, and I'm blown away by the performance. The craftsmanship and details on this thing are next level. I mean, we've all had that experience, you know, when you're going to practice, whether it be basketball, soccer, whatever you're playing, you know, you get a little nick in there, and you're just in pain the whole practice. Lawnmower 4.0 can help you avoid that. So Manscaped engineered the ultimate groin and body trimmer by focusing on intelligent functionality and an incredibly comfortable grooming experience. Their fourth generation trimmer offers features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. I now feel confident shaving my boys. This upgraded trimmer includes a multi-function on off switch that can engage a travel lock. It also gives you the ability to turn on the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when you need a more precise shave. So I'll just show you guys that here. As you can see, pretty cool. Lawnmower 4.0 even allows you to customize your trim through additional guard lengths with sizes 1 through 4. Men, if you've been shaving with the same nut trimmer that you've been using on your face, you've been doing it wrong, alright? Nobody wants pubes in their mouth, alright? Let's, 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 come on, let's, let's get behind that, fellas. So, it's time to get your own ball hair and body trimmer with Manscaped to make me time the best time and enhance your confidence with some nice smooth boys. So... Don't forget to get 20% off and free shipping with the code TBP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. And don't forget to use the code TBP. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Thank you so much to Manscaped for sponsoring this video and let's get back to it. I just want to reiterate that I'm only talking about guys that aren't like big name players on their teams. Like obviously Garland's value is going to go up from these absences on his team, but I don't feel like that's worth mentioning because he's not going to be on anybody's waiver wire and I don't think that's that helpful. It's pretty obvious. So just in case anyone was wondering before you comment, being like, oh, you didn't even mention that Allen and Garland are going to be better. Like, yeah, like no shit, dude. I think we're all aware. But anyway, going on to the Mavericks, someone that I still don't understand how he's only rostered in 40% of leagues is my boy Jalen Brunson. One of my favorite players in the league, and I just genuinely don't understand why he's only rostered in 40% of leagues. Like, Tim Hardaway Jr. is rostered in 65, but Jalen Brunson's offered it, only rostered in 40. Whereas Jalen Brunson's literally averaging more fantasy points per game on the season, and that's not to mention that he's going to have a better stretch with Luka Doncic being out. So, like, I would roster Brunson all the way up to an 8-team league. I'm not even exaggerating. 
He's been really consistent for fantasy, and while Doncic is out, he is, like, must roster in, like, most leagues, in my opinion. So, I've been on the record of saying that before, and I stand by it in this situation. Then, in terms of other players on the Mavericks, I could see having some value. Just while Doncic is out, there's just a lot of usage rate to sort of spread around. Obviously, Porzingis is going to be better. But in terms of other guys on their team, I'm thinking Dorian Finney-Smith could see a value increase. Could be relevant for fantasy. Especially for categories leagues, you get some solid defensive stats most games, so that's definitely a bonus if you're in a Cats league. But in terms of points leagues, he could have a few all right nights. Nothing going to like jump off the page, but if he hits his threes, contributes in the defensive stats, then he could have a decent fantasy points night. And then lastly, I think a bit of an underrated pickup on my list if you're in a deeper league. It's going to be Trey Burke. He's only rostered in around 0.2% of leagues, so in the absence of Doncic, Trey Burke's getting a few more minutes. He got like 20 minutes per game the last three. Could be worth a pickup. He is sort of a streaky player. If he gets hot, he could have a decent fantasy night. So he's going to be the third player. And I think that's it in terms of underrated Mavericks players who I can see their value increasing. Just while Luka Doncic is out with his injury. I know this isn't protocols related, but I figured I might as well talk about it. Because it is a pretty significant injury to their lineup. And it does create value for other guys on their team. And then we have another team that isn't really due to the protocols. But I just feel like i got to talk about it. Because Denver is just getting criminally underrated in terms of fantasy value. Because there's a lot of guys in their teams who can sort of provide value. And they're just getting like overlooked in my opinion. Like They're not rostered in nearly enough leagues for the current time period. With like all the injuries that are on the Nuggets roster. And we're going to go ahead and talk about the three-headed dragon. That is Monte Morris, Facundo Campazzo, and Bones Highland. So I think Monte Morris should be rostered in all the way up to eight team leagues right now. He's been having a really nice stretch recently if you look at his recent game log. And while he's, while he can keep it up for the whole season, I think is a bit debatable. I don't really think it's that sustainable. But while he is on this run, averaging around 19 points per game, really taking a big step in terms of his production for Denver, they really need like someone in the backcourt that can create alongside Jokic. And Monte Morris has been a very solid, consistent player the past few seasons, and he's sort of taken the next leap into like being a consistent starter for them right now so he's someone I'm definitely looking at picking up all the way up to eight team leagues like I mentioned he's only rostered in 25 percent of leagues so odds are he is probably on your waiver wire if you're in like an eight to ten team league I mean maybe not in a ten team but definitely in an eight team and then going on to another player on the Nuggets everyone's one of everyone's favorite players in the league Faku Campazzo if you look at like his last five games he's been contributing like at a 12 team fantasy 12 team fantasy level like he's been very solid in his performances and it's mainly due to his assist numbers being way up we all know he's a very capable passer but he's had the ball in his hands a little bit more recently and he sort of like contributed that to some very solid fantasy numbers he's averaging around 7.3 assists per game recently in the last seven days so if i'm in a cats league there's no way i'm leaving him on the waiver wire especially if i'm focusing on assists or anything he's only rostered in 1.5 percent of leagues on espn which is ridiculous man he's been putting up some very solid fantasy value and i highly recommend rostering him especially if you're in a deeper league sort of like a hidden diamond in the rough on the nuggets no pun intended but yeah i think he is worth rostering just for the time being and i think he's just being overlooked so if he's on your waiver wire i'd highly recommend grabbing him especially if you're in like a deeper league and then next up, we got Bones Highland, who has been a bit inconsistent to start the year off, but he is a rookie, it's to be expected. He hasn't been getting a ton of minutes, but he had a really solid game against Atlanta last game, put up 44 fantasy points. And while he doesn't contribute too much outside of the scoring department right now at this point in his career, I think it is could be worth a look just in the deeper leagues. Like I mentioned, he's rostered in less than 1% of leagues. So if you're in like a 16 to 20 team, I, I considered taking a look at Bones Highland. But yeah, like I mentioned, this isn't really a protocol one, but I just feel like People are always overlooking the Nuggets, and I think you could like squeeze out some fantasy value from some of these players I just mentioned. All right, so I skipped the Pistons and Golden State because they're not really dealing with any protocol people. Mainly, the only thing I would take away from the Detroit Pistons is like roster Sadiq Bay all the way up to eight team. I picked him up in my eight team, and I have not been disappointed the past two games. As soon as Grant went down, he had a 48 fantasy point game, and he just had a 46 fantasy point game against the Rockets. So while he's riding the streak and Grant's out, I think Sadiq Bay is definitely worth a roster spot in pretty much every league. Just for the time being, I think he is must roster at the moment. But anyway, who wants to talk about the Pistons that much? I mean, they're, they're losing games. There's not too many relevant fantasy guys outside of Cade Cunningham and Sadiq Bey right now. So that's all I have to say about them. But we'll go ahead and talk about the players that are on the screen right now. It's going to be the Houston Rockets. First off, just well, this isn't really protocol as well, but Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr. are both out. And Eric Gordon has just been going nuts as he has been for like the majority of the season, which is really surprising because... I don't think a lot of us expected Steven Silas to be playing the older guys, but I guess that's just how he's doing it. Eric Gordon has been really benefiting from this system and from this situation, so I think he's probably must roster and all the way up to like, I want to say 14 team, maybe even 12 team leagues. 
He's average, he has the potential to put up like 40 fantasy points on any given night right now because he has the ultimate green light and Houston's missing like their starting backcourt and it's just giving a lot of shot opportunities to Eric Gordon. So definitely look at picking him up if he's on the waiver wire. And then, of course, everyone's favorite friggin' fucking fantasy player. I can say fucking because I'm past uh, one minute into the video and we won't get demonetized, which you absolutely love to see. I can swear again. But anyway, Alpern Shengun, probably butchered that name. But if you follow the fantasy basketball Reddit sub forum, I mean, everyone loves him. Everyone's convinced he's going to break out and just be absolutely unreal because, you know, he's a white European dude. So he, that can pass the ball a little bit. So his fantasy value is going to be insane. But it looks like Steven Silas does not follow the red subreddit because he does not seem to care too much. He's not playing him at all. His minutes are like below the like below 20 minutes per game. Past four or five games, he's got like just over 20 minutes per game. But then again, it's nothing to ride home about. The one game where he got extended minutes was against Cleveland, and he responded with 47 fantasy points, which is a, you'll love to see it. But I just don't know how rosterable he's going to be while. We sort of wait for Steven Silas to play him. If you have the spot for like a long-term stash and you can afford to wait while his value is a bit low, then I'd definitely recommend doing it. But with Tyson in the lineup, it sort of looks like Steven Silas is choosing to play his veterans more, as has been the case for the majority of the season. So I'm not as high on Shengun as most people, but I do think he will have some value later on in the season. But to me, it's just like, can you afford to stash him or not? And that's pretty much what it comes down to. And then lastly, I just want to give a big shout out to Garrison Matthews, man. He's been killing it pretty unknown coming into the season and he's just responded by putting up some like incredible fantasy numbers really fucking solid shooter man i'm not even gonna lie he's been very decent to start the year and i would definitely look at picking him up i have him in my 20 team league or in my 12 team league excuse me and i do think he's 12 team rosterable but at like 14 to 20 definitely i think garrison matthews belongs on a waiver or on a roster excuse me so highly look at highly recommend picking him up if he's there and yeah that's pretty much going to do it for the rockets all right, so next up we have the Lakers, and we just had Anthony Day-to-Day -day Davis go out for around four weeks at the minimum, so definitely creates a bigger hole in their team than I was anticipating when I sat down to record this video, but we have a few players in the protocols as well. We got Taylor Horton Tucker, Dwight Howard, Malik Monk, Austin Reeves, and Kendrick Nunn. So in the meantime, guys I'm looking at picking up from the waiver wire, because obviously we all know like LeBron and Westbrook are probably going to go nuts. I'm, I'm probably going to take a look at Isaiah Thomas, mainly. I just want to give a huge shout out. I love Isaiah Thomas. Even though I am a Celtics fan, I can't believe we did him so dirty, bro. He literally gave his body to the team. Brad Stevens is a complete snake for that one, but it's whatever. He's only on a 10-day contract, but he's, he looked pretty decent in his first game with the team. Put up 19 points, only had 21 fantasy points, but I mean, if he can, he has something to prove. He's on a 10-day. Who knows? I think he has high upside, and if I'm in like a 16-team league, I'm probably going to take a flyer and roster him, honestly, especially if I'm at 16-team and above. I'm definitely going to roster Isaiah Thomas, and then Outside of him, I don't really see anyone outside of like the the main two guys on the team taking a huge jump in their fantasy value. So if you have Westbrook or LeBron, just enjoy this week. You're going to get some crazy fantasy numbers. I'd imagine Russell Westbrook's going to be on his triple-double shit. So definitely something to watch out for. I just wanted to give a quick shout-out to my boy Isaiah Thomas. Hope he makes the roster. But in the meantime, I would I would pick him up in a 16-team or above league. All right, so apologies for my voice being all croaky. This this video has just been killing my throat for some reason. But anyway, we're going to go on to the Miami Heat. And they're more dealing with injuries than protocol people. They only have, like, Caleb Martin in the protocols right now at this moment of me recording this, I believe. But if we look at some people that I think have taken some really big leaps in their fantasy value, first up is P.J. Tucker. Last five games, he's doubled his points output on the season. He's averaging around 15 points per game. And it's really elevated his fantasy status. I would consider him rosterable in all the way up to 10 team leagues right now. Maybe even in an eight team if like some of the previously mentioned guys that I had in this video already picked up. I think it could be worth taking a flower on PJ Tucker. He's really been providing in the absence of Bam Adebayo. So remains to be seen if that'll continue. But for the time being, I think he is a rosterable guy. And I think his fantasy value has taken a big leap with Jimmy Butler also being out. Then we move on to two very under-the-radar guys that I think are being overlooked in a lot of leagues. And first up is Gabe Vincent. I don't know if he's French. I may, might be Vincent, but decent point guard slash shooting guard for the for the Heat. Had a really solid game against Orlando. His last four games, have he's seen an uptick in his minutes to around 30-plus minutes per game, just with all the absences, that I, like I mentioned, that the Heat have been dealing with. The Hero's been in and out of the lineup as well. So Gabe Vincent's really stepped up. I think he is rosterable. He's only rostered in like... 2% of leagues right now, but if I'm in like a 14 team, a 12 team, I'm probably going to pick him up, take a chance on Gabe Vincent. Vincent, I'm just going back and forth with his name right now. I've had I've had a few brews, boys. It's it's a Saturday. We all know how it is. Doesn't does, doesn't matter. We 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 trudge on. Next up, uh, a guy that I think is really underrated as a not only as a fantasy player but as a player as well is Max Struess. 
Again, butchering your name. I'm sorry, Max. But even when he's on the Celtics, I, I like this game. You know, he, he was showing some flashes here and there, but responded with a 32-point game against Orlando the other day. Very, put up 53 fantasy points in that game as well. So overall, I mean, he's probably I'm probably going to take P.J. Tucker and then Gabe Vincent slash Vincent over him. But I think he is rosterable, especially if I'm in a 20 team. I'm picking up Max Struess just while he's getting the minutes. I think it's worth taking a flyer on because he could provide you with some decent fantasy value while Hero, Butler, and uh, Adebayo are out. So only those three guys for the Heat really, I think, see big impacts on their fantasy value. And then I'll just briefly mention that I think this is a good time to sell high on Kyle Lowry just while like the majority of the starters wrote Kyle Lowry has seen his fantasy production go up a few ticks. And I think it is a good time to sell high on him while this is going on because on the season he's only averaging around 34 fantasy points per game and I'm kind of expecting him to level out around 36 fantasy points per game and like for the last 15 days he's been averaging a bit higher than that like if I just check here give me one he's averaging around like 39 so I think that is a bit high so if you could sell high on Kyle Lowry I'd probably recommend trying it out because he is a bit of an injury risk as well to go along with the fact that his production isn't that consistent for fantasy he's sort of like a his value isn't really reflected in box score numbers, which is mainly what fantasy prioritizes. So definitely try to sell high on Lowry if he has, keeps up the stretch with the, the injuries to the starters, like I mentioned. And that's going to do it for all my comments on the Heat's fantasy value. Then we move on to the defending champion Milwaukee Bucks. They're dealing with whether a mixture of injuries and guys in protocols, but they're missing Giannis, Middleton, Portis, DiVincenzo, Lopez. And in the meantime, I think guys that are seeing increases in their fantasy value, Pat Connaughton's an obvious one. He's only rostered in 24% of leagues, but I would consider him rosterable in all the way up to eight team leagues. I do think his value has been pretty consistent over the season, especially when they're missing starters in Milwaukee. So definitely worth a look if he's on your waiver wire. Excuse me. And then next up, we got Grayson Allen, who's another guy who I think his main value only comes when the Bucks are missing starters. But while that's the situation we're currently in, he did respond earlier in the season with some decent fantasy value in this sort of situation, and I would expect that to increase again like it was at the beginning of the season. And we've already seen that against New Orleans. He put up 46 fantasy points, so you're not going to get too much in like peripheral stats, but it's mainly just the three-pointers and the scoring. Could have some big nights. Definitely worth taking a look at if he's on your waiver wire. And then, of course, we got to throw in one for the deep leagues. It's going to be Jordan. I'm not even going to Nawara, I want to say. N-W-O-R-A. I'm always butchering the names. I've, I, I, prob, I promise I watch these guys play. I'm just really bad at pronouncing their names. He's seen a big uptick in minutes recently, the last three games. He's getting around 20 minutes per game, so could be worth a look. He is a decent player. He's a younger guy, but he has shown flashes of being an all-right scorer, and when he gets the minutes, he has provided some okay fantasy value in the past, so he's definitely below like uh, Pat and Grayson in terms of who I'm picking up I would probably pick them up in that order like Pat Grayson and then Nuwara if they're on the waiver wire but if you're in a 20 team Nuwara's probably on the waiver wire as he's only rostered in less than one percent of leagues and I think he could be worth a look so again not too much fantasy value being spread around the Bucks outside of like Drew Holiday taking 36 shots last game he is resting today against the Cavs but he should be back on Wednesday and then it remains to be seen when the rest of the guys are going to return to the lineup. But the Bucks really just have nobody right now. So it's going to be interesting to see who sort of steps up. But those are the three guys that I'm predicting will take the brunt of like the increases in their fantasy value. And yeah, that's really all I have to say about the Bucks. On to the Timberwolves. I promise we're almost done. So don't have to listen to my croaky ass voice anymore. I need to drink some water. My voice is definitely going to be gone tomorrow. But whatever, we trudge on. Timberwolves main guy who's going to benefit from Anthony Edwards missing some time in the protocols is to me is Malik Beasley. He's a very similar player to Edwards and I think in the absence like he stepped into the starting lineup against the Lakers last game had 32 minutes put up 34 fantasy points and he's just sort of like a flamethrower guy like when he gets hot he does not miss from three. He has the potential to have some big nights in Edwards absence. I think he's the main guy that's going to benefit and I would roster him all the way up to eight team leagues. I think if he's on your waiver wire I'm probably I would probably snag him like even in my personal leagues I have him on one of my teams right now so I do think his value is going to be pretty high just in the absence of Edwards definitely worth a look and then Pat Bev just some people aren't aware that he has been like in and out of the lineup he has returned from his injuries and he's been on a really good stretch recently I mean he's contributing in the assist categories we all know he gets a few steals here and there the points are all right mainly just open spot up threes but if he's going to contribute in the assists and the points just a little bit it does make him relevant in like 10 to 12 teams I would consider him rosterable in those sort of leagues and then, yeah, lastly, I just want to give a huge shout out. Again, I just love when guys that are like underrated coming into the season or just have something to prove start to go off and really just perform like really well. I don't know what it is, man. I'm always rooting for the underdog. You know, you know how it'd be. But first off, Jan Jared Vanderbilt, 
I think he's been incredibly underrated for fantasy perspective. He's rostered in 17% of leagues, and he was like not even ranked inside the top 200 at the start of the year. He was ranked like 600 on ESPN, I remember, because I was doing a 20-team league draft, and I was like, I wonder who's the lowest-ranked player. And Jared Vanderbilt was like seventh out of like every player in the game, which is kind of crazy if you look at the production he's putting up now. But yeah, I would consider him rosterable and all the way up to 10-team leagues. He contributes a lot outside of the scoring category. So if you're in a, like a categories league, then I think his rebounding rate is very useful. It contributes a lot. And it's just very underrated place to be getting your rebounds because he's a guy that you probably got off waiver wire. Off the waiver wire, excuse me. I'm, I'm tired. It's late. But then also in the steals and blocks, he does contribute in the stocks quite a bit, which is a huge boost to his fantasy value because he doesn't really contribute too much in the scoring like I already mentioned. But yeah. With the rebounding and then the stocks rate, I think he's a solid categories player league for sure. And then for points league, I would roster him all the way up to 10 teams. So if he's on your waiver wire, I'd highly recommend taking a look at Jared Vanderbilt. Maybe you're overlooking him because he's not like a big name or that commonly known player. But I definitely think he's worth a look for sure. And he probably shouldn't be on your waiver wire if you're in a 10 team league and up. All right, so now we're on to the Knicks who have seen a lot of their backup guards going into the protocols recently. We got... Manual quick, quickly, McBride, Grimes, then Obi Toppin and Kevin Knox are in the protocols as well. Not that Knox has a huge impact on their rotation. As well as Derek Rose is out today. He's just out with an ankle injury though, so we don't know when he'll return. But with him being out, I think Kemba Walker has an increased role in their team. Against the Knicks, or against the Celtics, excuse me, he played 37 minutes and he contributed 38 fantasy points. Which I don't really get why Tibbs is benching him. I don't think he is the problem with their defense. I think... Tibbs is sort of looking at the wrong direction. Like, if you guys watch B-Ball Breakdown, he did a great video summarizing, like, what the problem was and how it isn't really Kemba's fault. And benching him doesn't make entirely that much sense, as there is other there are other players that aren't really contributing on the defensive end that much. But I think Kemba is worth a pickup, just with all these injuries and players that are missing games. RJ Barrett is also out in the protocols, so Kemba Walker's role is really increased. He looked like he had a lot of freedom on the court today against the Celtics, was getting to his spots. Looked a bit like some vintage Kemba Walker action. He did foul out a little bit early, but still had a decent fantasy game, all, all that aside. And in terms of other guys on the teams who I think take a big fantasy value that you might not be aware of, not really too many people, honestly. I think it is mainly just Kemba Walker. And then, like, because, like, they still have their centers, so I'm not going to say Mitchell Robinson's value takes that much of an increase. Other guys, like Alec Burks, I think Evan Fournier maybe have a bit more value, but I assume those guys probably aren't on your waiver wire. Maybe, maybe Evan Fournier in an 8 team would be on your waiver wire. He could be worth a look just while Barrett, all these other guys are out. And same thing goes for Alec Burks. He played 41 minutes today against the Celtics. Has some decent value. His, he's not rostered in as many leagues as I thought he was because he did sort of go on a bit of a slow stretch there. He's only rostered in 18% of leagues. But if I'm in like a 14 team, a 12 team, I'm probably going to give Alec Burks a look for this week. And yeah, I think that's going to do it for the Knicks. They're not missing a lot of key guys. It's mainly just Barrett and Rose. And Rose might be back next game. Barrett is going to miss a bit more time, but for now, I think it's, just, like I mentioned, just Kemba, Fournier, and Burks that are going to see some increases. All right, so in this is just a value. quick one because completely unrelated to the protocols or an injury, but can we please stop trading for Damian Lillard? I have seen so many people being like offering trades for Damian Lillard, and I don't understand why. Like, what are we doing here? Why would you take this risk? Or initially, I had him ranked high. I thought I had him as a buy low, but why would I want to deal with that abdominal injury like shit at all on my team? We don't know if he's going to get surgery we don't know maybe he'll play the whole season maybe he'll be back to his old form he had a really solid game against charlotte last game put up 71 fantasy points and a lot of people are being lured in they're like all right perfect now i should trade for him if i have dame Lillard on my team i'm definitely trying to move him and if i don't i'm not trading for him at all i just don't really see the risk because you're going to have to give up a lot to get him and it's just not worth it because he could end up like missing a ton of time this season he's already had two different stretches where he sat out games to deal with the abdominal pain that he has going on and I'm just, I just don't want him anywhere near my team. So, like, stop trading for him, guys. People keep seeing, offering trades. There is, like, no top 10 player in the league that I want to trade for less than Damian Lillard. And I've, I've explained my reasoning why on multiple videos. But why take the risk? There's other guys that aren't dealing with, like, a mysterious injury that might have them shut down for the season. And I just don't see the, the point in, like, trading for him right now. Because you're going to give up a lot for a huge risk. And to me, it's just not worth it. So, please do not trade for Damian Lillard. I, unless you're getting him for, like, a bag of chips which the odds of that happening are incredibly low because if he's on your team, I assume you're not going to take a bag of chips for Damian Lillard because you just sort of have to hope that he continues playing. But to me, if he's not on my team, good riddance. I'm letting some. I'm letting him be someone else's problem, and I'm not trading for him. So this is a bit of a rant, a bit of a tangent in the middle, but wouldn't be one of my videos if we didn't have this. So please just 
be aware and stop trading for Damian Lillard. I know he had a bad game, but people are just going to try to move him, so you have to deal with this shit, and I just don't think it's worth your time. All right, so then we, now we move on to the Sacramento Kings, who just have boys that are dropping like flies right now. They're all catching something going in the health and safety protocols. I don't think I can say the word because I don't want this video to get demonetized, but you guys know what I'm talking about, as it's been the theme of the entire video. But in terms of guys that are going to be fantasy relevant, the only ones that I can see that aren't big name guys would be Chimizi Metu or me too, we've, we've had this problem before, but I couldn't say his name, he's only rostered in 1% of leagues, and I think in the meantime, while all these players are missing on Sacramento, I mean, we got Fox out, Rashawn Holmes, Marvin Bagley, Mitchell, Davis, Alex Len, I think me too, or Metu takes a big leap, he played 36 minutes last game, which is, you just love to see that for fantasy value, especially for a guy that you're probably going to be picking up in like a 16 to 20 team league, if you can get guys that are getting starter minutes, it's just going to be a huge boost for your fantasy team. And then I think this is, outside of that, I think he's the only waiver wire ad. Him and Tristan Thompson, I should mention briefly. Tristan Thompson could have an all right game here and there just from like the rebounding rate. Could score a few amount of points. I don't think it'll be relevant for shallow leagues, but maybe for like a like a 16 to 20 team league, he'll probably put up some decent numbers for those, for those like type of leagues, I should say. And then I think this is a good time to sell high on Tyrese Halliburton and Harrison Barnes. They're probably going to put up some decent numbers this week. I w would be very surprised if they didn't because the Kings need people to perform. Halliburton has had two solid games in a row, and I would just try to move him. Not that there's anything wrong with him, but I just think his value is going to be a bit inflated due to the absence primarily of De'Aaron Fox and Davion Mitchell, but I just think he might as well take advantage of this opportunity. And then same thing goes with Harrison Barnes. He was really hot to start the season off, but he's sort of cooled down since then, and it just it looks like he's on like a downward spiral, so I would try to move him if I could. And then, I mean, Buddy Heal is just going to be mid forever, so I wouldn't really think this changes his fantasy value that much. And yeah, that's going to do it for the Kings. And now we're going to go ahead and get onto our last team of the video, the Toronto Raptors. All right, so now we're on to the Toronto Raptors. But really quick, I just want to mention that Bradley Beal is starting to play well. So, I mean, something to keep your eyes on, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, he's had a few solid games. Like the last four, he's averaging around 40 fantasy points. And I do think it's going to take an increase right now at the time of recording this. He's putting up 39 fantasy points, and there's still an entire quarter to go. So... Who knows, maybe he'll cuck and end with less than that, but I would expect him to end, end this game with around 45 fantasy points at the very least. So I did put him on a few buy low lists, and it's good to see that it looks like it might pan out. But anyways, back to the Raptors, which is the point of this slide, but, you know, I just get distracted as always. I just want to point out that I put Scotty Barnes as a sell high because he hasn't played with Pascal and OG. And, of course, just as he was about to, Pascal has entered the protocol, so we still haven't seen the Raptors at full strength, and it remains to be seen what Barnes' value truly is. But he had a really solid game again against the Golden State Warriors, even though they rested like their entire team. Nothing to take away from him, but his fantasy value is so inflated right now. I think he is the perfect candidate for a sell-high option. I don't think this changes anything. People commented on my last video being like, I think I'm still going to hold Barnes. You can hold him, but I'm just saying his value isn't going to be this high, so you might as well try to attain the maximum that you can in terms of a trade. Because I think once Siakam gets out of the protocols, OG is finally healthy again, and I think Barnes' value will take a dip, so... Just be aware of that and try to move him while you can. Maybe someone else will get sort of star-eyed for him and just look at the recent games. But I think that's going to do it for the video. This was a long-ass video. My throat is dead. Thank you guys for watching. I hope it helped some of you out. I know this is a very popular topic right now in the fantasy basketball realm because everybody is wondering what to do with their health and safety protocol players, who, should, who they should pick up. So I hope this helps you guys sort of narrow it down team by team if you want me to be more specific and sort of just talk about like in general like my waiver wire series where i do like keep trade or drop or maybe just like my waiver wire pickups for the week while i am continuing the upload every day until new year's this sort of content hopefully helps you guys out I will, i'm trying to be more in depth for this like two weeks that are coming up so hope you guys enjoyed like i mentioned i already said thank you guys for watching so i'll just wrap it up in a mess as always and say i hope you guys all have a very great rest of your day